American officials have long believed Osama bin Laden was hiding in a mountainous region along the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. However, there have been no reports of his whereabouts for years, and the trail appeared to have gone cold. Our World Affairs editor John Simpson assesses now a man who, until now, had survived all American attempts to kill him. For an entire decade, his was one of the most famous faces in the world. People everywhere were fascinated to know if he would emerge again from the shadows and indeed what had happened to him. Throughout his entire presidency, George W. Bush was unable to catch him. There's an old poster out west, as I recall, that said, wanted, dead or alive. But where bin Laden actually was, senior Bush administration figures didn't have a clue. He may be dead, he may be seriously wounded, he may be in Afghanistan, he may be somewhere else. He should never have been allowed to escape in the first place. American special forces had him bottled up in caves in the Tora Bora Mountains in eastern Afghanistan. But only a hundred or so soldiers were involved in the operation, while thousands of other American troops were kept on the sidelines. The local Taliban commander spirited him out of the area on a secret pathway which no one was guarding, and he got away eventually to Pakistan. After that, all we heard of him was the occasional video message, from which every clue to his whereabouts was carefully excluded. The CIA said they were genuine, and sometimes he referred to current events. There were many more audio messages, 30 or so of them in 10 years. Last year, he issued more than in any other year since 2007. <laughs> Since the Americans tracked him down through a courier, it must be a possibility that this relatively heavy traffic in tapes played a part in his downfall. Although his basic message was a deeply chilling one, Osama bin Laden in person was gentle, polite, and so softly spoken that you had to listen to him very carefully. His father was an immensely rich property developer in Saudi Arabia, and the family was huge. His childhood seems to have been a happy one. It was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979 that radicalized him. It's often been said the CIA helped to set him up, but that isn't strictly true. They did back some of his fundamentalist allies in Afghanistan, though. His view was that outsiders had no right to interfere in Islamic countries. When Saudi Arabia allowed the Americans to establish bases there before and after the first Gulf War, Osama bin Laden went on to the attack. From the training camps he funded in Afghanistan, he and his closest associates started planning a series of attacks against Western interests around the world. There was an unsuccessful plan to attack New York during the 1990s. There were other attacks in East Africa and against an American warship off the coast of Yemen. There was always a spectacular element, as daring as it was cruel, about bin Laden's deadly project. The idea of attacking key buildings in New York and Washington with hijacked aircraft heavily laden with fuel bore his unmistakable personal stamp. But it was all so brutal, so directly intended to kill ordinary innocent civilians, that there was revulsion right across the world, in Muslim countries as much as any other. Although there were other terrible attacks to follow, in Madrid and London especially, Osama bin Laden seems to have been only involved on the sidelines. His main concern was to stay free, even if it meant being a virtual prisoner of his own security advisers. There's always been a strong suspicion that elements in the Pakistani military secret service, which had helped him closely during and after the war against the Russians in Afghanistan, were looking after him still. In the end, though, it was good detective work which tracked him down to his expensive compound in Abbottabad. With hindsight, it was inevitable. So was his death. He was never going to surrender to the Americans, and perhaps the Americans didn't want him to surrender to them. Our Affairs editor John Simpson there.